uh, deputy project scientist for SOFIA. I also have a couple other roles I have at SOFIA as well, but this, for the time being, that's what I, what I am. And uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit before you get on the plane, talk a little bit more about the science that SOFIA is going to do and uh, did do. I'll show you some of the results we've got. Uh, I'll only be able to show you some of the results. We've been flying all summer long, and we've taken a lot of very, very good scientific data. Unfortunately, the, most of that data right now is still being analyzed, and it is also um, the, uh, under the purview of the principal investigators who have actually proposed to do that work. So they get a certain period of time, like anything else in, in science, where they get exclusive access to that data, and then it be, uh, afterwards goes out to the general public and anyone. Uh, Anyone in this room, anyone anywhere, can go online and uh, pick it up and do what they like with it. So let me just talk. First of all, I was just going to talk very little bit about the uh, uh, the, uh, there we go. Uh, the astronomical science from Sophia. I'll show you a little bit of the, some recent results, and I'll talk very briefly beforehand what you're going to be seeing on the airplane. So Pam Markham at the, at the uh, beginning of your tours here today talked a little bit about why we do infrared astronomy. I won't go that much into it. As you know, there's really three big reasons why infrared is particularly good for doing astronomy. For things that are seen very far away, um, the light due to the, the uh, Big Bang is redshifted into uh, longer wavelengths. And so with starlight, for example, we don't see invisible light when it's far away. We see it in infrared. And of course, when you're looking far away, you're looking back into time, too, because it took the light so long to get here. So you're looking at very old and far away things. Cooler objects, such as stars in the process of being form, formed, have uh, their, uh, most of their radiation actually coming out in the, uh, uh, in the infrared. And plus, as Pam mentioned, that uh, we have the ability to penetrate the clouds of obscuring dust in the universe, which are pretty quite prevalent. And as we joke, we just uh, in the infrared, we observe the old, the cold, and the dirty. Uh, and we do that very well. And in fact, infrared is, is very, very popular. If you actually look at the James Webb Space Telescope that's going to be replacing the Hubble, that's an infrared telescope. Uh, it's got a lot of advantages. Now that we have the technology that can do that, uh, that we can use to uh, apologize for this picture like this. Um, I will not spend a lot of time going through here, but in SOFIA, there are some particular areas that SOFIA is going to be good for with the size of its telescope, with its ability to fly above almost all of Earth's atmosphere, especially the water vapor in the atmosphere. And uh, a couple things that we've looked at so far, um, we've particularly we've looked at this area around the black hole in the center of our Milky Way. There's a, about a three million mass black hole right in the center of our galaxy. And uh, we've also uh, looked at um, the outskirts of the solar system, the presence of moons. I'm going to show you some data that we've done on, that gotten on Pluto, the, uh, the minor planet Pluto. So it was demoted from a planet. And SOFIA particularly is, is good at some things, and particularly compared to something like Hubble. Uh, we can see objects that are much cooler than normal stars, than the sun, uh, stars and planets are forming. Uh, we can see stuff behind the dust clouds. Uh, we have an infrared telescope in space right now, a Spitzer Space Telescope, but it's smaller. Its mirror is smaller than uh, uh, SOFIA's, and as a result, it can't see things with as uh, close a detail as SOFIA can. So, um, and also, we've got plenty of instruments I'm going to show you right now, the instruments we've already got uh, available to us. And in fact, we've actually, at NASA, just uh, selected, or not selected, but have accepted a number of proposals for a next generation of instruments for SOFIA. We'll select the ones that we think are the best, they'll get funded, and so we'll get some additional instruments as well. The, uh, as Pam mentioned earlier, SOFIA is much like a space telescope, but it comes home every night. And uh, that means that if you've got a broken instrument, you can fix it uh, rapidly and set it back up. And you can also get new uh, instruments on board. Now, the Hubble was able to put new instruments on, but it was at a tremendous cost. A space shuttle launch is, you know, many hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, swapping an instrument out of Sophia is uh, considerably cheaper. And as you've also been told, that we can actually fly other guests, like teachers and journalists on board. That's already been, has already happened and will continue to happen as we fly SOFIA. So there's basically four major science themes for SOFIA. We are going to be interested in galaxies and our own galactic center. Um, and uh, we'll be interested in interstellar medium, the space between the stars and the Milky Way, because that's where new stars form. 
uh, we'll be interested in the formation of stars and planets, and then our own uh, solar system. And um, we've got a number of instruments that we've selected for doing this. Uh, these have been right here. You are going to see two of these instruments on the flight. Uh, we normally only one instrument at a time is mounted on the back of the telescope, but we do have the ability to put this instrument called HIPPO and this instrument called Flight Cam on and work at the same time. We actually did that for the very first time last night when we flew the plane up here in the first place. And um, I actually was not on that flight, which is why I'm not staggering with tiredness right now to talk to you. But I did get the email messages, and apparently it worked quite well for the first time. You, 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 there's always little bugs whenever you do that, but it, it generally worked pretty well. Um, just real quickly, this is our first light. The very first time we actually tried to look at anything in the infrared. Uh, we looked at Jupiter. This is what Jupiter looked like in the infrared, at these four wavelengths up there compared to what you find in the visible. And we looked at another galaxy, the core of another galaxy, M82, which is called the Starburst Galaxy. It's um, very uh, tremendous activity of star formation in that galaxy. And here's an area here too. This is where this is our data. You can see the sky is very different if you compare it with what you see in the shorter infrared wavelengths, and of course very different than what you see in the visible light with the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, here's some more recent data again. Uh, it, uh, here's our, uh, our data uh, looking into the center of this area that was seen on the Spitzer Space Telescope. Uh, these are a couple other missions here. This is the uh, Digital Sky Survey, and this is the visible. And then this MSX was an uh, Air Force mission uh, that was also interested in the background sky. And uh, so these are <coughs> some data. This is another instrument that we've flown before. It's called Grayton. Great, it's a German instrument. It's a uh, basically a very, very fancy, sensitive radio receiver that actually looks at the radio emission from molecules in, in space. Uh, and this is they they actually look, they can actually map areas in certain lines. This is the this is the uh, emission from the carbon monoxide molecule in this uh, uh, area of this nebula called M17, SCA17. This is, in fact, what you're going to actually see on the airplane right now. This is flight cam here, like here. Kind of, it's a little bit, in this picture, you'll, it's hard to see, but you'll see on the plane, there's a black thing in here. That's the, uh, the HIPPO instrument. And um, it's, uh, and so in fact, this is the configuration that we've got on the plane right now that you'll be seeing. I'm going to skip over these uh, uh, um, things with the, uh, the I'm going to talk about another advantage you've got with SOFIA, and that's that it can fly anywhere on the Earth. If you, uh, as it turns out, that one uh, technique that you can use to get uh, uh, good um, data is to actually take your astronomical object and um, have it uh, uh, pass in front of a star. And um, There, I'll go through this fast here. And this, these shadows of a planet were going in front of the stars only go over a certain place on the Earth. And mostly there's not telescopes there. But of course, with SOFIA, we can fly anywhere in the world. And we've also guaranteed to have clear weather as well. So if you've got the object in the way, and there's a shadow here, and there's only a certain spot of the Earth, we just fly our plane underneath there and, uh, and, and do the observations. And in fact, this is one that we observed back in June. This was the planet uh, um, Pluto and uh, its satellite uh, Charon. And this is uh, a map of the globe. It showed where it shows where the uh, um, that that particular. Uh, I won't go into this here, but it, it allows us to see the uh, the atmosphere uh, of the planet. And in fact, this is the path of that shadow on the Earth. And. Uh, this is the, in red here is our flight path. It's actually a pretty tricky navigation because this shadow is just zooming across the Earth, going at about 5, uh, 57,000 miles per hour across the Earth. Sophia can't fly that fast, so you've got to be at the, exactly the right place at the right time in order to see that uh, shadow as it comes whipping by you. 
And uh, this is, in fact, the data. This is the light from the star. <coughs> it's dipped, in, and I'll show you a little movie briefly here, of the, uh, as, this, as the star uh, winks out, um, because as the planet goes across. In fact, this is it here. You can see this is just staring at the star. It's kind of twinkling as the plane is flying. Uh, you can see the scintillation. And you'll see it fade out. You actually don't see Pluto. You just see the, uh, the, the star going away. And then it'll come back again. This was a group uh, led by Ted Dunham at Lowell Observatory, and using that HIPPO instrument that you're going to be seeing in the plane, here comes the, uh, the star back again. And that data that I skipped through before is uh, very, it helps a lot with uh, understanding Pluto's atmosphere. Although it's very far away and it's very small, Pluto actually does have an atmosphere. And one of the things we're particularly interested in, Pluto, as you know, as you may know, has got a very eccentric orbit. So it's sometimes it's closer to the sun, sometimes it's further away. Right now, it's heading away from the sun. We detected an atmosphere on Pluto, but there's some models that show that that atmosphere may freeze out. It may just end. So we were quite curious to see if the, if the atmosphere <coughs> is still there. As far as we can tell, in fact, it is still there. And um, so that's, uh, that's one of the, the first initial results that we actually got uh, using this particular technique. But it's, it's, Sophia is very good for that, because it's very rare that you'll actually have these shadows uh, going across a place of the Earth where there happens to be a largish telescope, and, and we can, in fact, find uh, Sophia there uh, uh, as, as we'd like, and like I say, with clear weather. Anyway, uh, that's uh, all the time I wanted to spend right now. I apologize for going so rapidly through here. We're a little bit late, but I do know that you want to get on the plane. I've also got, you've got a group 